and pop whatever um okay i don't i don't think you need a thing um okay thank you first of all the organizers for the opportunity to come here to vigo and present my work with adi uh this is actually work that i've done when i was still doing my phd in stuttgart and now i moved to, to the weizmann institute and i'll be talking about uh how can we learn about topological interaction equations actually from the perspective of mean interaction equations? So we call it dimensional hierarchy or fermionic topological inter uh, interaction equations. Um, so the questions we want to ask is whether the topological classification of free fermions is somehow robust to interactions. We already know that this is not the case. But even though we understand very well in low dimensions what happens, what happens actually in higher dimensions, we would also like to have an explicit form of an interaction that would lead to different topological phases and different SPPs. Um, and we would actually like to find, just in the same way that they're in the non-interacting phases, they're such a nice structure of, uh, of topological phases, what actually exists in the in the interacting case. So the way that I'm going to proceed is by explaining you what happens in one dimension. And then I'm going to show you how the classification of non-interacting phases works and how does the, the, this dimensional hierarchy appears. And the protocol that I'm going to use is reduce whatever is my problem, whatever the symmetry and whatever dimension to the one dimensional case. Um, so SPP phases. So what are SPP phases? These are topological phases, but these are just, in the end, band insulators. There is no topological order. They are short range entangled phases with a single uh, ground state, and this ground state preserves all the symmetries of our system. And we can say that it's topological because there is so-called bulk boundary correspondence, that is, the there are different topological sectors characterized by different edge excitations. And as long as we preserve the symmetry, we cannot remove this excitation. So there is an adiabatic discontinuity between these sectors. Um, and in this talk, even though I'm going to go to the interacting case, I'm going to still be talking about fermions, which can also be connected adiabatically to the non-interacting case. So interactions generally can also lead to very different uh, topological phases, different still uh, SPP phases in the sense that they are short range entangled. Um, but here I'll be only talking about phases that can be adiabatically connected to the non interacting. Um, so the simplest example is, of course, the Kitaev chain, and this we understand very well. Uh, and what we do is that we have a, a chain of fermions in with, a, with, a, um, with a atomic in itself. And the, the usual trick to do is to separate each fermionic uh, degree of freedom into a real and an imaginary part. There is the two Majoranas, and these Majoranas are actually remission operators. Uh, the way we entangle this now this, this Majorana states is going to tell us in which, um, in which topological sector we are. If we have some strong bonds within the unit cell, this is can be adiabatically continued to the atomic limit. But of course, if we um, connect or make a, a strong bond between the one Majorana to the Majorana and the other in the other uh, unit cell. If we are going to cut the system, there's going to have some dangling bonds and there's going to have, uh, there's going to appear some unpaired Majorana modes which can be filled at no cost of energy. Um, so this this in class B the one, so this is with time reversal and particle hole symmetry. If we add more and more chains, actually we cannot even couple the Majoranas that appear at the edge. So this means that we classify the topological invariant of Z, uh, which like the coupling between these Majoranas on the edge is forbidden by time reversal symmetry. So what the, um, Kwiatkowski and Kita have told us is that there is this is not robust to interactions. In fact, if we put eight of these chains, it's going, it's, it's possible to write down an interaction that would uh, adiabatically connect uh, this state to a trivial state. 
And the way that we can understand this is just simply by looking at the edge. Okay, so let's look at our Majorana in the edge and write down what can we possibly write down in order to gap it out, preserving, of course, the symmetry. If we try to gap out two Majoranas, this, of course, because it's an SPD, this the, uh, it will break explicitly time reversal symmetry and we cannot gap it out. If we are going to write a uh, symmetry preserving interaction with four, it's also possible. However, it will still give us a degenerate ground state. This is basically something like a, a density density type of interaction when we write it down in terms of, of, um, of complex fermions. But another thing that we can also do is indeed pick up, like start with eight fermions on our edge, cou couple every two of them by forming a complex fermion and write down the simplest interaction that you can that you can do this is psi one, psi two, psi three, psi four, plus our mission conjugate, and this indeed will have a singly degenerate um, ground state which preserves the full symmetry. So then we can see that the, topo this, the eight topological sets that can can be trivialized in terms, of course, of the of the edge states. It's also possible to numerically calculate the full adiabatic path. In fact, th what we can do is by turning on this, while we turn on this interaction, we can turn off this, this, uh, this strong bond, so we can turn off the hoppy, uh, while keeping the always a gap, a gap in the spectrum. And actually this problem becomes very simple because instead of being to, to the power of n, actually it can be mapped into an n times n problem and it's, a, um, it's linear in the, in the system size. So in the end we can actually see that we just need the tiniest interaction in order to, to trivialize the system completely. And um, it's actually another way of looking at this interaction, it's which is actually very, very relevant now for, for works of Josephson junctions, for example, is we can write it in terms of spins. And uh, indeed, we can write down um, we can we can write down a spin spin interaction by combining every complex two complex fermions into a spin full fermion, uh, which does not break the symmetry and will allow indeed to, to open up the gap. So of course there's many approaches actually to to solve this problem. Well, the the majority of them actually have it's complicated to look at higher uh, at higher dimensions. Um, or it's not necessarily exhaustive, but our motivation was actually just to look, gain an intuition of what these interactions mean in, in uh, higher dimensions and see what can we say, or is there any nice structure when we go to higher dimensions. Um, so what we are going to do uh, is just slim, simply write down a Hamiltonian, which is a representative of a topological sector in the non-interacting in the non-interacting system. This is can be done, of course, by simply Dirac Hamiltonians. That is linear combinations of, of gamma, gamma matrices that enter to mu with each other, um, and depending on the mass term that we add there, we are going to go to different to the different symmetry classes. In particular, we just have to uh, assure these conditions to see if the, on the basically on the mass term, to write down what is the is the time reversal of the particle full or the chiral symmetry. Chiral symmetry is particularly interesting because it basically tells you that there is an operator that anti-commutes to the Hamiltonian. This means that there's in the um, when we write down the Hamiltonian, there will be one gamma matrix that is missing. So from this, uh, this strategy, we can just simply write down all Z classified uh, Hamiltonians. And in 1D, this can just be in class A3, BD1, and C2. This means class A3 and BD1, uh, this uh, both can be written as a two by two matrix, where we can leave one out, which is the sigma three, which will enter to mu to the Hamiltonian. The difference actually between A3, which is a complex class, and BD1 is how 
if we impose any conditions in our creation operation operators, so if we have um, actually some kind of reality condition implemented in our basis state. Um, and C2 is singlet, basically singlet superconductors, and it will need to be a four by four, four by four matrix, but still it will be kind of symmetric. Uh, we can write down a, to a, a topological invariant for the system, which will be a winding number. And this means that we will have edge states and the edge states will still be chiral symmetrical. So this means that they are helical. In contrast in 2D, of course, what we'll have is, um, is we'll, need, we'll have an extra dimension, so we need to add another Dirac matrix. And in the end, there will be no chiral symmetry left unless we would go to a, a higher dimension on, the, on our preferred algebra. And, uh, and what we will have is a sure number where the edge modes are actually chiral. So from this type of prescriptions, you can write down whatever, um, whatever Hamiltonian you would like, as, or whatever Dirac Hamiltonian that represents your topological section. Okay, so from this, we can see that there is a very nice structure, in particular in all, all uh, odd dimensions we will have a chiral symmetry will have a, a phase characterized by a winding number, and while in, a, in a even dimensions will have um, chiral, which will have states with a churn number, there is like states with with helical, uh, with chiral edge modes, and the, there is a relationship between them, which is just basically called the, bo the bot periodicity, and uh, the bot periodicity can be understood simply by looking at how the Dirac Hamiltonian, uh, when we go one dimension, basically what we want to do is we start with the Dirac Hamiltonian, we are going to compactify one of the, one of the, one of the directions. And what, when we do this, we're just basically, what we're doing is a picking up a momentum, making it into a circle, making the circle very small, and this will discretize the, the, uh, our momentum eigenvalues, and we can just pick up the, the lowest energy at some point, the other ones will be, uh, the other levels will be too high in, in, in energy. And what we'll, we will end up is also with, uh, with the Dirac Hamiltonian. And the, but we will necessarily change the symmetry class while we are doing this. And one thing that it becomes clear is that we'll, we'll go from one symmetry class that has chiral symmetry to one symmetry class that doesn't have chiral symmetry. But also if we do it properly, we're able to uh, find the, the, the changes also in how it changes with time reversal and particle full symmetry. So in particular, we can go from class D3 to class D to class PD1, and this follows what is so-called and very neatly organized as the bot clock. Um, so let me look here in the particular case of class D3. We start uh, with an Hamiltonian in three dimensions. It means that we are going to use uh, three, uh, three of the Dirac matrices to make, uh, to make the, the Dirac Hamiltonian. We are going to open up a mass, and we'll still have one left as our chiral symmetry. We're going to compactify. This means that we are dropping out one, and what we end up with is something that actually has too much symmetry, it, was, it has chiral symmetry and, a unitary, and an extra unitary symmetry, so it has indeed two chiral symmetries left. Uh, this means that we can block diagonalize your, our Hamiltonian and look just at one corner and this will be classified by, uh, it, this will be in symmetry class D, so it will lose its chiral symmetry in the, mean in, the, in the meanwhile. We can compactify again and what will end up is with the, with the Kutaev chain. So. Uh, what, so, but this, another way that we can think about, uh, think about doing this dimensional reduction, instead of compactifying every time one direction, what we can do is project out one direction by looking at the surface. So, if we start with uh, the, 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 the superconductor, the three-dimensional superconductor in class D3, what we are going to do is make a kink in the mass. This means introducing a surface. Um, and when we look at the surface theory, the, at the low energy theory on the surface, what we will have is, of course, a Dirac cone. This Dirac cone now has a lot of symmetry, and we can break this symmetry explicitly. We can just 
literally put, uh, um, for example, a ferromagnet on the top that will open up this uh, open up this gap. And what will end up is necessarily a, a bent structure on the surface that carries its topological invariant. So it will have a turn number of one. So if we want to continue to do this process, so basically if we want to engineer to have this Mayor and a chain on the surface of a, of a three-dimensional superconductor, we'll run out into a problem right now. In fact, if we do it again by putting a kink, by putting a mass now with a kink, with a, we can do this by putting a very hyperbolic tangent, we will have an edge mode, but it will have a single edge mode which will be chiral. And actually there's nothing that we can now put in order to open this gap. This is, this is basically, it's like a, a thermal quantum Hall state that is just, just transports energy um, and there's nothing, there's, it will, al it's like it will always be protected from backscattering. Um, so of course the, the obvious solution to take care of this problem is by double our system. So if we start uh, with two, if we start with a, a topological sector two, so we are, when we look at the surface, what we'll have is two helical Majorana modes and if we make sure that we are going to break the, the, the symmetry on the surface, but we are breaking it in a symmetric way, so what we're going to do is to put a kink like this and a kink like that on the other, affecting the other topological sector. Um, what we're going to end up having is chiral modes propagating in the opposite direction. So what we introduce is one kind of like Z2 type of symmetry, which can be achieved by Z, SZ conservation mod 2, for example, or uh, some mirror symmetry. Mirror symmetry is not local, so it's a little bit more complicated, but in the end, something of this sort that we can, we can impose in our system. And from this point, we can indeed continue our construction and we can create a gap, which opens and we'll have a kink, and what we'll have is exactly one Majorana mode localized at the vortex. Uh, so, this all to say what we can do is start with some, some Hamiltonian, some three-dimensional superconductor, and we need to guarantee that it has enough symmetry that we can create a single protected, um, a, a single protected Majorana mode on its surface, which will, uh, which will emerge by creating a topologically protected uh, vortex on its surface. And what we need to do, of course, is to guarantee that we have enough Dirac matrices to do so. So we start with now four-dimensional Dirac matrices. We introduce, we, we put have two of them to have like the, the momentum on the surface and we use the other two in order to create um, a, a topological defect. And even though this now, this Hamiltonian breaks all the symmetries that we started with, what we'll have is an emergent time reversal symmetry that now squares to plus one. So this is indeed in the correct symmetry class. And um, this will host a single protected Majorana mode and we can easily calculate this by just defining what is the projector. Um, and it will be given, it will be given in, this, in this particular way. Um, so what now we want to claim is that if there is a, a clear protection of eight Majorana modes on, on, uh, in zero dimensions, then this will guarantee the stability of 16, of the topological sector 16 in class D3. Um, and if we have anything, bef so, so and, the, and the argument goes like this, if we have anything which is less than, than, than uh, 16, than the topological sector 16, what we will have in the defect is something less than eight Majorana modes, which can never be gapped. Or we can have, for example, if we would, we would start with a topological sector that is odd, then we could not make this construction until the end. And what we would have is something like a, a single propagating mode, which is a one-dimensional mode coupled to something that it's lower dimension, basically the interaction would be completely uh, ineffective. This is this is and this is trivial interactions that will cause cause no fundamental change in in the low energy theory of your system. Um, so, in order to reduce 
this, this topological sector, we need to find an interaction, which is of course short range. You don't want to couple the edge modes just simply by, by introducing long range interactions, which preserves the symmetry and will necessarily gap all boundary modes. And this can simply be done by using the, oper the symmetry operator itself. And when we look at this interacting, well when, when we look at this interacting Hamiltonian, we can see that by acting exactly with the same projectors, by looking at the, at, the, at the defect mode, what we will have is the interaction that we needed to gap the, 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 the Majorana. So now we can do this in a more we can do this in a more explicit way to guarantee that in the in the in the in the symmetry class D three so in the three dimensional superconductors we actually don't have any surface states and how we can convince ourselves that this is true is for example by introducing a mass term that 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 oscillates so basically what we are what we when we start. With two with surface states, with two surface states on the on the on the on the two Dirac surface states, then basically we want to discretize this into a lattice model by explicitly breaking the symmetry, um, and this can be again this be done by the by the oscillating mass, and what we will have is at each of these defects will dif will create a different a different projection or we'll uh, spatially isolate all the entries of our initial spinner. And uh, when we introduce an in the interaction here, which will basically project to, the, to, this, to, this, uh, to this defect mode, to always to the interaction necessary to gap them out, and when we weakly re come back to, to, to couple them with a the hopping and recover our, Dirac, our, Dirac, our initial Dirac theory, this will, this will be a gap theory. So it means that um, it will be reduced. Def it m what it means is that in the, 16, in the 16 sector we won't have surface states if we introduce such an interaction. And um, the main argument that we have is that basically if we can, if we can write down an interaction that will gap all possible localized states, being like surface states, edge states, or or or, um, or vortex states, it doesn't matter. If this interaction will project to the one that will, will do the job of gapping it out, then this will also have do the job of, of trivializing the the the, um, the bulk, and the on reversely the interaction that does trivialize the bulk will get will project an interaction that will will gap all the zero modes which are in defects. And the way that obviously this must be true is because we can make arbitrarily small what would be the coupling between zero modes and high energy modes by choosing uh, a mass term that is, that is very large. And by locality, we can also not couple them to, to um, by locality, we can also not couple, couple them to, to bulk states. So basically what we need to do is to identify a correspondence between the topological sector and the number of zero modes which are localized in defects. Um, and this basically tells you a, a very strict rule on what would be the reduction of the classification for, uh, for any, an, any symmetry class in the, in the Z classification. And this is, given, this is given by this formula. Basically, we would have the spatial dimension and the number of modes that can be gapped in a specific symmetry class. And this can be different because this can be, if you, have, you, if you are in a superconducting class, your, um, your how do you say, uh, the, the, the excitations that you're dealing with, they're Majorana, so which are actually half fermions. If you can also realize what would be class BD1 by introducing chiral symmetry as a sublattice symmetry, so then in the end, the, there you would have sp um, uh, spinless fermions. So then you need to understand what happens in the one-dimensional case that this is the one, this is the n zero, and uh, this is this is the, the this is mu, and the n zero tells us how many we would need to to gap them out, and from there you can write exactly an explicit interaction, and what you'll get is a very simple rule on how the symmetry will ha the, the number of uh, the um, topological sector that can be trivialized is changed with 
with uh, with dimension. So it follows exactly like the bot clock, but every time that we cross a symmetry uh, symmetry class that has chiral symmetry, we must double this number. Um, so this is this is what appears in here in this in this figure. Um, okay. So finally, like now we are interested in seeing exactly how uh, such topological transition happens. So now we we even though we do understand that what would what would happen with the defects, right, we we would like we would like to 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 understand what happens really with the quasi particles when we introduce such interaction. And uh, the the way to one of course in one D this system is, is is particularly simple, but in two D we have many more other ingredients that become important, for example, symmetry breaking. So if we are adding so much symmetry in our system, what happens when we go through uh, when we go through this phase transition? Are we always actually bound to have symmetry break? So we write down, we're going to write down a simple model in two dimensions that will show all this physics and what we are going to do on Epic Monte Carlo. And this is now, pro um, this is now work in progress. And uh, we're, I'm just going to quickly explain to you what the model is. We just have a hopping term. We, we just have a hopping term. This is all complex fermions. So the in principle, this, this should, redu uh, should reduce to to class it um, should reduce to Z four, so we have a hopping we have hopping terms, and this is basically what is a, a lattice model of the Dirac training, and of course we can see that it is a four dimensional model, so it has both chiral symmetry and this extra Z two unitary symmetry that guarantees that that even dimensional phases can be can be reduced. And what is nice about this problem is that there is an emergent time reversal symmetry, so you can actually do Monte Carlo on this. Um, and you can write down your interaction exactly in the same form as we had before. Um, and while we know that our critical point in one dimension is exactly a zero, now in one dimension, this, 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 now if we go one dimension higher to two dimensions, we don't really know what happens at the critical point in particular we had some kind of condition that the, 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 the interaction had to be bigger than, than the hopping between these vortex states. So we are actually expecting this to be at a critical point higher in energy. And we can also expect to have, with along, along the adiabatic path, to have symmetry breaking happening. And uh, it seems from the data until now that there is a uh, symmetry breaking order that we are going that we are seeing on the way um, and uh, so this is it it might be that it's uh, we just have like too much symmetry included in the, our model that we can still reduce this but we cannot completely exclude that we are going to go through a symmetry breaking transition for sure so this brings me to my conclusions, um, what we have is that in all dimension, uh, in all dimensions, if we guarantee that we have chiral symmetry, all the, the topological phases classified classified by a z topological invariant are going to be reduced by z n, and this means that all the odd dimensional phases are going to reduce in this very simple pattern. And the all even dimensions, we need to introduce an extra z two symmetry in our system. And this, this N is actually very simply determined and it's just counting criteria in the end, but seeing how, what is the dimension of the Dirac Hamiltonian and how many uh, of the Dirac matrices and how many of them do you actually need to construct both the kinetic part and the mass terms. And then we can write down exactly a form for this, this, this interaction which will lift off this state and um, so, so we can write down an interaction for any, for any dimension. And of course, the next step is to understand what it is actually this phase transition in higher, in higher dimensions. And um, okay, I have a question. Um, there is 